Hello everyone, it's time for another chemistry video, and this one's going to get toasty. Today's topic is combustion. It's the science of how stuff burns. You may have wondered, as I often do, how and why combustion happens. How do sparks come about, and what are these things we call flames? Why is it that objects set on fire release smoke into the air? What chemical compounds are in that smoke? It's an interesting process that provokes many questions. Finding answers to those questions is well worth the effort, because combustion is so important to our lives. People around the world use it to warm their homes, cook their food, and power their vehicles. It's the driving mechanism of such distantly related things as candles and interplanetary rockets. We also need to understand the products of combustion, those new compounds formed when something burns. They include harmful greenhouse gases, which contribute to climate change, but also innocuous substances like pure water. Here's how the video shall be broken down. Firstly, I'll do my best to explain what combustion is and how it works. Then I'll apply this knowledge to the combustion of hydrocarbons, molecules that are often used as fuels. Finally, I'll show you how to write and balance equations that represent the burning of hydrocarbons in an oxygen-rich environment. This is the kind of content you can expect in a high school chemistry exam. Okay, let's light it up. The first thing to realize about combustion is that it's very different from simply melting a substance. Melting is a physical change that occurs when a solid compound has to liquefy in response to high temperature, low pressure, or a combination of both. Combustion, by contrast, is a chemical change in which the bonds between atoms are ripped apart, then rearranged to form different substances. The original substance is known as fuel, and it can be solid, liquid, or gaseous. Firewood is an example of a solid fuel, while the butane in a pocket lighter is a gaseous one. Since combustion is a chemical reaction, it needs some specific ingredients to get started. The first ingredient, obviously, is fuel. The second is lots of heat energy, like the heat coming off a lit match or a blowtorch. The third ingredient is oxygen, in its molecular form, O2. This is the same form of oxygen we breathe in, and it comprises 21% of the air surrounding us. It's oxygen that gets in between the atoms of the fuel and binds with them, creating new compounds called oxides. Put those factors together, and we have what firefighters call the fire triangle. If you have enough of each of these ingredients, you can start a combustion reaction. Once it starts, the reaction is usually self-sustaining, because the fuel releases more energy than it uses up. This extra energy was previously stored in chemical bonds, but now those bonds are being torn apart, energy is flooding into the environment. It's this outgoing heat that warms our living rooms and cooks our pasta. As well as energy, the fuel spits out gaseous oxides that drift away in the atmosphere. In this case, the oxides are mostly carbon dioxide and dihydrogen monoxide. You're very familiar with the second compound, even if you don't recognize the technical name. It's humble water. But hold on, I hear you say. If combustion reactions produce water, how can they be self-sustaining? Wouldn't the water put out the fire and stop the reaction as soon as it was formed? Come to think of it, doesn't carbon dioxide also snuff out fires? Those are reasonable questions. It's true that both water and carbon dioxide can halt combustion reactions, which is why both these compounds are used in fire extinguishers. However, when they are actually produced by combustion, they are very hot and appear as gases. Since hot gases rise into the atmosphere, they naturally rise up and away from the fire, for example, up your chimney. There is no chance of them smothering the fire in this situation. Now would be a good time to address the different types of combustion that are possible. I just described complete combustion. 
in which plenty of oxygen is available to react with the fuel. Complete combustion converts carbon-based fuel into carbon dioxide and water vapour, the most chemically stable oxides that are possible. It's recognisable due to the hot blue flame and the low amount of smoke visible. By contrast, incomplete combustion occurs when the oxygen supply is limited. It still produces some amount of water vapour, but instead of carbon dioxide, we observe some carbon monoxide or solid carbon in the form of soot. These substances contain less oxygen because there was less available to react with in the first place. Incomplete combustion progresses with an orange flame, which is cooler than a blue flame, and gives off smoke and black soot. Of course, the exact products you'll get, and even the flame colours observed, can change depending on what fuel is being burned. For this video I'm focusing on hydrocarbons, which are fuel molecules containing only the elements carbon and hydrogen. The simplest is methane, which looks like this. When methane undergoes a complete combustion reaction, it is dismembered by the surrounding oxygen to form one carbon dioxide and two water molecules. More complex hydrocarbons are converted into the same products, just in larger amounts. Octane, for example, is a long hydrocarbon containing eight carbon atoms. It's found in petrol and is combusted in order to power cars. The gases produced by this reaction occur in such high amounts, and expand at such an explosive rate, they can drive an engine and spin the wheels of a one-ton vehicle. That's pretty impressive for a common piece of chemistry. Broadly speaking, hydrocarbons can be divided into three main groups, alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes. What separates them is the type of chemical bonding observed in each group. In alkanes, neighbouring atoms are joined together by single bonds, where one single bond contains one electron from the outside of each atom involved. In alkenes, there is at least one double bond, in which two electrons from each atom are shared. Finally, in alkynes, at least one triple bond exists, which contains three electrons from each atom. It can be tricky to remember which of these groups is which, because their names are so similar. If you have trouble with this, write down the names and look at the fourth letter in each one, the only letter that differs. It's A for alkanes, E for alkenes, and Y for alkynes. A comes first in the alphabet, E comes second, and Y comes third. So alkanes come first, containing only single bonds, alkenes come next with double bonds, then alkynes with triple bonds. As I mentioned earlier, fuels release a lot of heat energy when the bonds within them are broken. Double bonds release more energy than single bonds when this happens, and triple bonds release more still. That means, while alkanes are no slouch when it comes to energy production, alkenes give off even more energy for their volume, and alkynes even more than that. You may be surprised, then, to learn that alkanes are still the most used hydrocarbon fuel by far. There are practical reasons for this. Alkanes are plentiful in natural gas and oil, whereas the other types are harder to come by. Also, alkenes are too valuable to burn in large amounts. They are instead used to produce plastics, pharmaceuticals, and a myriad of other useful items. Now you should have the knowledge required to tackle some combustion equations. An equation like this is a visual representation of a real chemical reaction. On the left side, we write the chemical formula of each original substance that went into the reaction. For combustion, it's always a fuel plus oxygen. For this example, let's use methane as the fuel. The chemical formula for methane is CH4, one carbon atom bonded to four hydrogen atoms. The chemical formula for atmospheric oxygen is O2, as I said before. On the right side of the equation are the products. For complete combustion, as we discussed, the products are always carbon dioxide and water vapour. 
Your teacher will probably ask you to indicate the physical state of each compound involved. We can indicate the state of a compound by writing either S for solid, L for liquid, or G for gas in a pair of little brackets like this. Methane is a gas at room temperature, so every substance involved here is gaseous. In the middle of this equation is an arrow, and as you can see, it only points one way. That means the reaction cannot be reversed. You can't take some carbon dioxide and water and unburn them to make methane. If you could, it would break the laws of thermodynamics and probably break the universe by extension. But anyway. Take a good long look at the equation we've made. It may look like we're finished here, but there are some adjustments to make. Can you see what I mean? The problem is, this equation is not balanced. What do I mean by balanced? I mean, there is a larger amount of matter on one side than on the other. Specifically, the left side of the equation contains more hydrogen and less oxygen than the right side. It's vital for a chemical equation to be balanced, so that the same number of each element exists on either side. If the equation is unbalanced, that means matter is either being warped into existence or annihilated by the reaction, and that's impossible. Let's see what we can do to balance this equation for the complete combustion of methane. Firstly, we should consider the compounds containing carbon. There is only one such compound on each side, methane on the left and carbon dioxide on the right. They both contain just one carbon atom, which means the element carbon is already balanced. Great! Next, we should consider the compounds containing hydrogen because, again, there is only one such compound on each side. There are four hydrogen atoms on the left side, bound in this methane molecule. On the right side, we currently have two hydrogen atoms bound in the water molecule. That means the left side contains twice as much hydrogen as the right side. What do you think we should do to balance them out? If you said double the amount of water produced, it's a gold star for you. In order to keep the amount of hydrogen balanced during this reaction, we need to produce two water molecules for every one molecule of methane. Technically, we could also halve the amount of methane, but that would put a half here, and it's much nicer to work with whole numbers instead. Finally, we need to balance the amount of oxygen on each side of the equation. On the left side, we currently have two oxygen atoms bound together in this molecule. On the right side, we have two from the carbon dioxide, plus one from each water molecule, making four in total. The amount of oxygen on the left side is half that on the right side, so we need to double it. Now the equation says that one molecule of methane plus two molecules of oxygen produces one molecule of carbon dioxide plus two molecules of water vapour. We can count the number of atoms in each element to see that they are indeed balanced on either side. This is a fully balanced equation that shows precisely how methane is burned in a complete combustion reaction. Brilliant! You can apply this approach to any hydrocarbon, no matter how many atoms it contains. Let's recap the steps involved, and this time I'll show the example of propane combustion in a barbecue. First, you need to identify the compounds involved in the reaction and find out their chemical formulae. In this case, we have propane with the formula C3H8, combining with oxygen, O2, to form some amount of carbon dioxide and water. Next, you should count the number of each element, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, present on each side of the equation. If any of these numbers differ, you need to perform a balancing act. It's easiest to first balance the amount of carbon on each side. Propane contains three carbon atoms, so we need three lots of carbon dioxide to match. We leave the other compounds alone for now because they don't contain any carbon. Next, you can balance the amount of hydrogen on each side. Propane contains eight hydrogen atoms, whereas one water molecule 
contains just two of them. Try quadrupling the amount of water, and you'll get the required number of hydrogen atoms on the right side of this equation. Finally, you'll have to balance the amount of oxygen. There are currently two oxygen atoms on the left side, within this molecule, but there are ten in total on the right side. Six of them come from the three carbon dioxide molecules, and four from the four water molecules. We need five times the amount of oxygen gas on the left side to provide balance. And that's it! We're all done! I hope you have found this video helpful and learned something new about combustion. If you want to know more, feel free to ask a question in the comments section below. You can also show your support by liking and sharing, as well as by subscribing to my channel. Thanks very much for watching, and good luck with your studies.